Um, each week uh, we have a main talk which is longer than the community moment and we try to really focus on the whole breadth of the human experience. We've talked about literature, the arts, sciences, all kinds of interesting stuff. We try to bring a diversity of voices to the podium each week. Uh, a lot of times we have guest speakers. This week we're going in-house, one of our very own, uh, is going to give us the main talk today. He's well known to the crowd as the man who's given more community moments than any person in <laughs> history. Um, so, uh, and I think as the Oasis movement spread, I bet you're doing more than anybody in Kansas City. I mean, and as this grows, you, I, I think you're gonna have some kind of claim to fame here. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, today he's not doing a community moment, he's gonna give a main talk on viceroys and monarchs, and I'm gonna let him explain what this is all about. Let's give a warm welcome to our friend, Luke Hannah. European royalty. It's primarily about monarch butterflies. And if I get to it, I'll tell you how viceroy butterflies get involved with this. See if I have time. Um, there's a puzzle that most of you may know comes from the movie version of the musical, The King and I. That's a, a very famous Broadway musical. The movie version starred Yul Britter who plays the king of Siam. And uh, he's reflecting on his life as a boy, as a teenager, and now as a king, monarch. And he does a song called, Is a Puzzlement. Well, so I use that to kick off the fact that there are still puzzles about the migration of monarch butterflies. So the focus of my presentation will be on the migration and if there's time, we can get into other things like evolution and et cetera. So, let's see. For me, this all started, uh, I played tourist in Washington, D.C. about three years ago. And my plan was to spend five days and see as many things off the Washington Wall as I possibly could. The museums, the monument, the Lincoln Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Martin Luther King Memorial, et cetera, et cetera, didn't happen because I wound up spending a day and a half of my supposed five days in the Museum of Natural History. It is the most wonderful place you can imagine. If you like natural history, and most of, I, most of us do, this is like nirvana. <laughs> and, um, and it's free. There were two things in the museum that I thought were particularly worth mentioning. One of them is, um, recall the room that we're in when we're at Tracy G, how big that room is? There's a room like that at this museum devoted to evolution and nothing but evolution. Um, and the funny part is, you can see the Washington Capitol from this building, and they can see the building. <laughs> All the politicians who deny evolution are reminded of what they voted for. Okay, the other thing that got my attention was a movie they were showing. Separate admission cost $8, the museum is free. <clears throat> and it was on the migration of monarch butterflies. And the focus was on an entomologist who spent 40 years trying to figure out what is the migration pattern of monarch butterflies. And he never did. In a minute I'll show you why. What's interesting is his children took up the cause and they were key to discovering what the migration pattern of monarch butterflies is. The way I look at this is, um, if you've watched a, a, a crime show program on TV and there's a murder, the detectives first have the challenge of finding who committed the crime. That gets more complicated if 
they can't figure out why anybody would want to kill this person. So part of the problem with discovering about monarch butterflies is A, where the heck do they go? And B's, why would they ever do that? <laughs> and we still don't have all the answers. Maybe we can talk about it. Okay. So that was, this, this, that speech kind of piqued my interest over and above uh, any that I'd had before. And then, Things got real serious where I visited Fort Hill in Orleans, Mass. I go to Cape Cod about once a year. Orleans is in the outer Cape. Uh, I had not been to Fort Hill before and I was kicking myself. Um, it's actually a trail. It goes off of Highway 6 and goes all the way out down to the ocean. It's maintained by the Department of the Interior. And I took advantage of a guided tour by one of the rangers for the Department of the Interior who do a hell of a job. And she took us on a guided tour of this. I'll tell you, when you go to the parking lot of, 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 of this, this assault marsh, it will take your breath away. It is that beautiful. And there aren't too many places that I've been, and I've traveled most of the world, that really took my breath away. So Christine, took us on a tour, and basically you leave the parking lot and you kind of wander around. And there's a lot of milkweed there. And butterflies only eat and only breed where there is milkweed. So maybe that's why they migrate to certain places? We don't know. So I got a second dose of monarch butterflies from Christine, this ranger. And then I called her up a couple of weeks later and say, I gotta give a talk on this, can you fill in some blanks? And she's more than happy to give me some time. <coughs> nice lady. <clears throat> By the way, to break things up a little bit, um, Fort Hill is a salt marsh. Salt marshes are the second most biodiverse areas on Earth. So anybody know what the most biodiverse area on Earth is? Amazon. Nope. Amazon Basin. But salt marshes come in a close second. One of the reasons is the basis of the salt marsh is peat moss, which generate heat. Everything grows there. And one of the big challenges of the Department of Interior is keeping out the invasive species you know, Chinese tallow trees that take over. You know, this. this is an absolutely gorgeous place. Um, Grand Canyon, to put you in, in to, didn't take my breath away because I knew exactly what to expect. This did. It's free, and etc. Okay, it's part of the Cape Cod National Seashore. Okay. So, um, monarch, monarch butterflies are called the king of butterflies because they're so beautiful. Um, they have a four-stage life, life cycle, which is not very much different from the life cycle of most insects, so I'm going to kind of not spend much time on that. It's the migration that's really, really different, okay? So there's a four-stage life cycle. And in most of the places the monarchs migrate to, they go through this life cycle, but not all, which threw me kind of for a loop because I had this down. You go here and you breathe, blah, 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 but it doesn't all happen. Okay? So the life cycle is repeated with one exception at each location that the butterflies have migrated to. The puzzlement is why do they do this? And we still don't know. We got a lot more answers than we did before when this entomologist tried to figure this all out because we now have gliders, we have satellites, we have geolocating. So it's a little bit easier to follow the monarchs now than it was four years ago. Okay. Um, so there's an exception to this. Um, 
at each site where the butterflies. Oh, okay, good. Thank you, Mike. I get so involved with the presentation, I forget you can't hear me. Um, <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So in each site, the. I'm missing something. You got a whole you got a whole now. Okay. Yeah, Jessica, get a picture of that. <laughs> okay. So, at each site they migrate to. And there's four sites. Butterflies find a mate. They do that everywhere. Okay? But with one exception, the four life cycles occur, and that's laying of an egg, caterpillar, pupae, butterfly. In all cases, the parent butterflies die within four to six weeks. and the newly hatched butterflies migrate. <clears throat> so, let's see if this works. You all see that? It's going to move. It's the migration pattern for the eastern monarchs. So they're going from their winter home in Mexico up through where Hanks are in West Texas. And they go all the way up to southern Canada, <coughs> Ontario, etc. And then they come back. So it's kind of like a loop. So, maybe this will now help you discover why it was so difficult for this entomologist to figure out the migration because at every location, if you remember, the parents die and the children migrate. So it's like you're following the parents and all of a sudden they disappear. Okay. This is what really happens. The triangles of a winter winter nesting place. This is basically the same as the last slide, but it's the whole range. This is all taking place in one year. So as you can see, the western <coughs> monarchs, <coughs> which winter in Southern California, basically stay in California. The eastern monarchs, which winter in Central Mexico, go all the way up to Canada and come back. But remember, it's not the same butterflies. Okay. So, we'll go briefly through the life cycle because I want to focus on migration. That's a monarch egg. Blown up version. Um, the females actually lay hundreds of eggs, but only one per leaf. So that's why you only see one. That's the second stage. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention. Yeah, one of the things that they discovered about the migration of monarchs is they have what is known as a time-compensated sun compass. <coughs> which to us means they've got kind of a GPS. <laughs> um, the 
caterpillar is probably the most interesting of the four phases of the life of a butterfly. And so I don't have to come back to it. <coughs> Notice these little uh, projectiles here on the front and the back. Also notice it's kind of hard to tell the head from the tail, isn't it? That drives the birds crazy. <laughs> um, a caterpillar, and I hope I have time to talk about it, is one of the most magnificent examples of evolution that I've ever seen, heard of, read about. <clears throat> so. Phase two is the caterpillar. Phase, phase three is the pubi. And when they get fairly well developed, you can actually, um, this is transparent, you can actually see the wings of the butterfly inside. <coughs> this is between phases. This is the uh, caterpillars being encased in the pupae. And also known as a chrysalis. And this is the butterflies actually hatching from the chrysalis slash pupae. Okay. Um, that's a monarch feeding. <clears throat> Pretty beautiful, huh? Now, because the migration is a loop, it doesn't really start and end anywhere. But in order to do a presentation, I had to have a start. <coughs> so I decided that the start will be the first generation of the monarchs, and it will start in the mountains of central Mexico. Nobody knows why they go there. That's part of the mystery. There doesn't seem to be anything there that is so appealing. There's no milkweed there. But nevertheless, in the latter parts of the year, the monarchs will go from Canada, and they will fly all the way down to the mountains of central Mexico. And if you go to see them, there could be 20 or 30 million adult monarchs there. I've seen this in California. It's quite a sight to see. Um, the reason why there isn't any milkweed in central Mexico is because milkweed thrives on moderate temperatures. If it's too cold or it's too hot, no milkweed. And it's pretty chilly. It's like zero to 20 degrees in these mountains. It's fine with the adult monarchs, but it doesn't do very much for milkweed. Okay, so um, they get to these mountains in central Mexico in October, November, and they semi-hibernate. They're not as asleep as you might think. Um, I had the privilege of doing this in California. If you put out your hand and one of the monarchs lights on your hand, as soon as they get some heat from the sun, They'll flutter their wings and take off. So they're not really hibernating. But nothing much seems to be happening. Matter of fact, when the monarchs are in this semi-hibernation, the only time they move is to find a place that's more comfortable. <laughs> They'll move to another tree or a branch on the tree. Springtime comes, and they go down to the ground, and they're, gonna, they're hungry, so they'll feed on water and nectar. And then they find a mate. Once they find a mate, they take off. So one of the places they go to is Texas. And it's because there are 30, at last count, different varieties of milkweed in Texas. It's not a record, but it's enough. <laughs> so the monarchs migrate through Texas when they're going north, and they migrate again when they're coming back. 
But again, it's not the same butterflies. The question is, how the heck do they know? Works for them. Okay, so generation one is in Mexico. Generation two is consistent with the second, third, and fourth, is that the, uh, the monarchs have migrated to Texas. Um, they lay their eggs, because remember they made it in Mexico. The eggs hatch, they go through the four life cycles, and shortly after that, the parents die. Generation three is very much like generation two. They head for the northern United States, Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, and they go through the same thing again. They lay their eggs, eggs go through the life cycle, parents die, the new children take off, and they head, in this case, for Canada. <coughs> Okay, now this fourth generation is born in September and October in southern Canada and migrates south to Mexico. <laughs> so back we go again, but it's four different migrations and it's four different butterflies. So you can see why this drove this etymologist nuts. <laughs> You know, he track a track a butterfly, and all of a sudden they disappear. So here's here's the nice part. Uh, the, what I thought was, I got this out of a book. It says no mon monarch ever migrates to a place it's been before. Okay, no monarch ever migrates to a place it's been before. The question is, how the heck do they find these places? Except for Mexico, all of these locations have milkweed. But if you're flying a couple hundred feet up, you don't know where the milkweed is. <laughs> so. Plus, that you're a relative newborn. So this is a summary of what the previous slides had, okay? Let you read, just read that. Can you all see that? <laughs> Number six is important. generations are actually four different butterflies going through these four stages during one year until it's time to start over again with stage one and generation one. You probably all figure that out for yourself. Okay, so we have sort of an explanation. It is amazing how the four generations of monarch butterflies works out so that the monarch population can continue to live on throughout the years but not become overpopulated. So maybe that's the secret. Maybe they have like this death wish so that the monarchs don't become overpopulated. So, as Mother Nature sure has a cool way of doing things, doesn't she? So, this explanation doesn't explain everything, but it's the best I've seen as to why, and, and you gotta kinda, it's kinda fun, at least for me, because I'm a little bit of a Mother Nature nut, that if you're watching a nature film and you see a new insect or animal and it apparently has evolved from a less successful version, you kinda try to trace back, to figure, okay, well what must have happened so that zebras now have striped skin, maybe, you know, it's a camouflage thing. 
So it's kind of an interesting exercise. Try to figure out why did the monarchs go through all of these stages of, of evolution to get to and this particular phase? And we don't know that it's the end of it, but it seems to work. Um, the only thing that's endangering monarchs now is, of course, the same thing that's endangering most animals. It's, it's uh, territory reduction. And there's another problem with uh, with the monarchs. Okay. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. All right, I wanna summarize this up. And I have a bunch more slides that talk about um, the caterpillar of itself and its evolution and how the various phases of monarchs protect themselves against predators. I don't have time for that, so maybe at some point We'll finish this. So let's see what I want to skip through. This is what it looks like if you go to the forests and the mountains of central Mexico and you see all the monarchs, but it's 20 or 30 million. And this is what it looks like when you're swarming. This is what it looks like in central California. Okay, let's see. This is all about Okay. This works out well. This is a viceroy butterfly. There is anecdotal evidence that says viceroys didn't always look like that. Monarchs have developed a number of defense mechanisms to ensure the propagation of the species. Viceroys haven't. So apparently what's happened is viceroys are starting to look more like monarchs. Because monarchs are more successful. Um, in nature, this is called co-mimicry. Um, <laughs> Uh, co-mimicry between viceroys and monarchs is the sincerest form of fluttery. <laughs> okay, enough for the day. Yeah. All right. Thank you all.